100% renewables. Uh, as Angelina said, uh, the goal is an important one. Um, and now in 2017, it seems a lot more viable than it probably did uh, as little as five years ago. Uh, there's a bill in the legislature, which I'm sure you'll hear about a little bit tomorrow, uh, that calls for 100% renewables by 2045. But, you know, a word of caution. Um, the, the idea is really not to get to 100% renewables. It's about reduction of greenhouse gases and greenhouse gas emissions. And those are not necessarily the same things. So I think it, it's a lot, it's something you can get your hands around a lot more easily. And the, the, the goals that California has set on renewables, 33% by 2020, which we're definitely gonna meet, and then 50% by 2050, also I think well within our sights, uh, are important because they give us something very concrete um, to evaluate and measure, but it's not really about the renewables themselves, it's about the emissions created by the energy sector um, and the relationship to the transportation sector, et cetera. And so this is all part of the overall set of, of goals that we've taken in California to uh, describe as uh, the six pillars of uh, action on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So renewable portfolio standard right now, 50% by 2030, as I noted. Um, it will no doubt expand, whether it's 2045 or something in that neighborhood. Um, energy efficiency, doubling energy efficiency in buildings by uh, 2030, and you just heard a panel about that. Um, <clears throat> transportation, cutting oil uh, in the transportation sector in half by 2050. Um, both on the demand side and on the supply side. Short-lived climate pollutants. I don't know if, we've, if you've talked about that or not yet, but I'm sure there's a, a lot of knowledge about that in this room, um, where we can actually take uh, the, the uh, pollutants out of the atmosphere in, a, in a, our lifetimes and buy us some more time, unlike CO2 that will stay uh, for a lot longer uh, than, than we're alive. Um, and then uh, the final two pillars, uh, right now in California, unfortunately, working in natural lands are the source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions rather than being a sink. Um, and we're working very hard to understand those mechanisms and how to change that. Um, and then finally, uh, and inevitably, uh, resilience and adaptation uh, is essential. Um, but having said all that and, and having spent a, um, a huge amount of time and e energy working on this set of issues, at the end of the day, California still represents only about 1% of the world's emissions. So, you know, why, why uh, do we care and how do we have a, an impact uh, outside of California? So uh, as Angelina said, um, the seeds of, of the idea of what used to be called the Under Two MOU uh, and is now called the Under Two Coalition um, were, were uh, the result of some discussions between uh, Governor Jerry Brown um, and uh, actually Baden-Württemberg, not North Rhine, <laughs> uh, stayed in Germany. Um, that Ike of Eber uh, helped put together. Um, and uh, it started as a simple conversation um, between the minister uh, in Baden-Württemberg and, and Governor Brown, s sort of bemoaning the fact that even though California is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, uh, it had no seat at the, at the Paris negotiations. Um, and that was true of Baden-Württemberg, a somewhat smaller economy, but still uh, sophisticated. And uh, certainly in, in our view, um, much of the obligation um, and impetus to take climate change action occurs at the subnational level, at, at the level of states and regions and provinces and cities. Uh, and yet, as I said, no voice. 
California is larger than 190 plus of the countries that uh, signed on to the Paris Agreement. Um, and so what to do about that? Um, and what we devised was the, uh, an, a, a, uh, the under two MOU that has two particular um, points um, that, that are operative. The first is that signatories agree to reduce their emissions by 2050 uh, by 80% uh, from 1990 levels, or, and the, the or is important, um, they uh, agree to reduce uh, or keep their emissions below two tons per capita. And the reason that's important is that uh, there are, are lots of jurisdictions around the world that are not uh, industrialized, um, that have not historically produced a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, that had no reason to reduce their emissions by 80%. Um, and uh, we weren't asking them to do that. And the result of that has been that the under two coalition encompasses both developed and developing regions around the world. So this struck uh, a pretty substantial chord. Uh, I might say uh, to a little bit to our surprise, we now have a coalition that has over 170 jurisdictions uh, all over the world, all uh, inhabited continents, um, representing uh, uh, over a billion people and uh, well over a third of the world's GDP. Um, China is a uh, significant participant and uh, we are making progress with India. We're, uh, we'll be announcing a couple of uh, additional Indian states joining uh, in the next few weeks. So uh, the, the response has been dramatic and significant. Um, and so now the question is, what do we do with it? Um, and how does this relate to 100% renewables? So uh, um, the what we have now is the most ambitious and active jurisdictions around the world working together towards the same set of ends. And I, the, the other um, operative point of the under two MOU is that each of the signatories produces an appendix describing what they'll do in the 2030 timeframe consistent with the 2050 uh, goals. Um, and so we have statements from not all of them, but from the majority of these jurisdictions as to where they're heading um, with their ambitious set of, of efforts. And these now uh, set out uh, a series of actions that uh, are worldwide. So we are focusing on three specific areas. Uh, the first is basic inventories. What are the, what are, what does the jurisdiction produce in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? You might think that that's well known. You would be wrong. Um, in some jurisdictions, it is fairly well known what the emission profile is. Uh, in other jurisdictions, um, it's not so well known. And this is replicated at the national level. There are countries that really do not have a good handle on what their current emission profile is. So we are working with the 170 jurisdictions to ensure that they're, they're transparent um, and that they report uh, through a UN sanctioned process. There's something called the Covenant of Mayors and the, the Compact of States and Regions. They're all sort of merging into a, a, a process that allows for much greater transparency. Um, second, how do you get to 2050 um, uh, in something that we call a deep decarbonization pathway. Uh, it turns out that um, it's one thing to, not surprisingly, to sign an agreement that identifies the interest in getting to an 80% reduction or staying under two tons per capita, but doing that in a real economy in real time uh, over the course of now 32 years is really extremely challenging. So in California, we've done this. We've gone through a process where we evaluate under existing technologies what kind of trade-offs there will be and how you get to, to where you want to go for this 80% reduction. Um, and we learned quite a, quite a few things in doing that. We're promoting that in different jurisdictions around the world. 
so that different economies have a different sets of roadmaps to get to that, um, uh, to bring that to fruition. And as you can imagine, um, given that renewables uh, are a known set of technologies, even though they're evolving, uh, we know a lot about them, and that those are a very significant portion of every deep decarbonization pathway. And then the third set uh, of areas, um, in some ways is for me the most interesting, um, it's, it's more of a catch-all, um, what are the uh, sets of things that different jurisdictions can do uh, to reduce emissions. And that may be very different. We have maybe a dozen rainforest states uh, that are part of the coalition. What does their economy look like uh, in a sustainable rainforest economy that preserves and protects the rainforest? Um, very different than what California looks like or Baden-Württemberg. Um, uh, we have the, uh, among the coalition are what are called the four motors of Europe. Um, the four largest industrial regions in Europe are all part of this coalition. What does their economy look like and what are the things that they need to do? We can talk about short-lived climate pollutants. Um, together as a group, how do we uh, attack the methane problem uh, from, from dairies around the world? Well, now we have a coalition of 170 subnationals, a subset of which have very significant methane emissions issues that can work together in a group to try to deal uh, with a set of problems. And we see this as a way to really push forward with different sets of, of goals and, and ac actions. Uh, I'll just give you an example because it came up last week and it was something I thought about a little bit, but now I'm thinking about quite a bit more. It turns out that there's a group that is worldwide um, that looks at greenhouse gas emiss emissions from hospitals and the healthcare uh, industry, which is a very significant source of emissions, um, but we have not looked systematically at how to deal with healthcare based emissions. Um, so now we're talking to this group about looking at the jurisdictions in the under two coalition and putting them together to have a uh, basically a worldwide approach um, to reducing emissions across hospitals uh, and the healthcare businesses uh, around the world. Um, we have a, another subset of working group around ocean acidification. Um, and how we both uh, reduce the impacts of acidification and how we respond to that from a resilience point of view. And so this is replicated um, in a series of work groups that we're developing. Um, one of the big challenges that we have right now, I guess uh, I'm sure it will shock you to hear that fundraising is not so easy. Um, and, and so we're, we're kind of building this process as we go. Um, as we get more funding for particular actions, um, we take those actions uh, and we have a secretariat, um, it's an entity called the Climate Group, which is based in London, um, and they're adding staff uh, right now. In fact, they're going to hire two people in California, so if, uh, if you want to get your resumes ready, uh, um, it'll, uh, they, they have some uh, beautiful offices in the Presidio in San Francisco. So, um, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, the, the timing, uh, the response and the timing uh, has been, uh, it, our timing was excellent, the response has been very strong, um, and now we need to execute um, and show that regardless of the federal government's abdication of responsibility here, um, that we are in a position um, there are 10 U.S. states and 11 U.S. cities that are part of this coalition. Um, we're working uh, around the world with, uh, as I said, uh, dozens and dozens of, of entities. And whatever uh, the federal government does, uh, it's abdicating its responsibility, uh, at least rhetorically and in other ways, um, there is an alternative. Um, and we are working um, to quantify 
uh, the relationship of the U.S.'s NDC, the nationally determined commitment under the Obama administration, to reduce by 26, 20, I can't remember, 26% by 2025, something like that. What, what amount of that the states are going to be able to cover, along with cities and businesses, um, and that'll be part of what our response is to whatever uh, the uh, federal administration does about the Paris Agreement. So uh, there are alternatives. We have a way to drive this into the international community, and the 100% the renewable set of goals um, that, that groups like RE100 have and uh, other states and jurisdictions around the world, not yet California, but possibly, um, uh, are going to drive uh, a lot of change, and uh, we think that this is a good mechanism uh, to ensure that we continue moving forward with our efforts. So, thank you.